In the summer of 1967, James Bond producers Harry Saltzman and Albert Broccoli were at a crossroads. Sean Connery, the actor who had helped propel 007 from a pulp literary hero to a cultural icon over the course of five hit movies, was walking away from the series. It's hard to overstate just how important Connery was to the franchise's success. Bond director Terence Young attributed all of first film Dr. No's popularity to the charismatic Scotsman. And as Connery's star power grew, Bond's marketing team took notice. Posters for Thunderball and You Only Live Twice were just as eager to stress Connery's name as they were Bond's. Now, the series would have to make do without him and the timing couldn't be worse. While the latest 007 adventure, You Only Live Twice, was technically a box office hit, it was also the first Bond movie to earn less than its predecessor, suggesting that the series' earnings had hit a ceiling. Coupled with Connery's departure, the future of James Bond was uncertain. Of course, Saltzman and Broccoli wouldn't go down without a fight. For the sixth Bond movie, Producers turned to On Her Majesty's Secret Service, one of Ian Fleming's most acclaimed novels. Peter Hunt, who had worked on the previous Bond films as editor and second unit director, would make his directorial debut, and his ambitions were nothing less than to make the best James Bond movie yet. For the eponymous hero, the producers took a risk on George Lazenby, an Australian model with little real acting experience, but counterbalancing his inexperience were seasoned pros Diana Rigg and Telly Savalas, as the Bond girl and Bond villain, respectively. The resulting film was a perceived failure. On Her Majesty's Secret Service opened in Christmas of 1969 to tepid reviews. Critics were largely mixed on the whole, but nearly every major reviewer noted Lazenby a dull 007 particularly when compared to the alluring magnetism of Sean Connery. Mixed reviews for a Bond movie were nothing new though. The truly crushing blow was the box office. On Her Majesty's Secret Service grossed substantially less than You Only Live Twice, topping out as the second lowest grossing Bond movie. Sorry, ma'am. Of course, being the second lowest grossing James Bond movie is a lot like being the second shortest player in the NBA. The film still made a lot of money. Its 9.1 million domestic gross put Majesty just outside the top 10 highest grossers of the year and more than cleared its budget, particularly when you also consider the total worldwide grosses. Whatever disappointment the producers felt, it was not enough to stop them from making more Bond movies. Connery was lured back at high cost for 1971's Diamonds Are Forever, which grossed more than double of Honor Majesty's Secret Service, both domestically and worldwide. And so, the series continued, and continues to this very day, occasionally approaching the spectacular successes of Thunderball and Goldfinger, but always as a reliable moneymaker. James Bond lived. And yet, a sense of finality still pervades over On Her Majesty's Secret Service. The film itself is imbued with tragedy, in both its premise and conclusion, daring to challenge the conventions upon which the Bond fortune was made, moving the character into unmarked territory. In its stylistic hallmarks and iconography, the film marked a culmination of the Bondian style filmmakers had developed throughout the 1960s, while simultaneously experimenting with new formal concepts. The decade which birthed Bond mania, with countless imitators and a profound influence on action-adventure filmmaking, was closed out with a Bond story which confidently drew from its forebears while still creating its own identity. And in its final minutes, the film would shatter the preconceived notions of who and what Bond was. The series would never be the same again. Even with ever more sequels and a revolving door of 007s, James Bond, or at least a specific vision of James Bond, ended with On Her Majesty's Secret Service. But before I dive into a factually incorrect argument about how a series with a new movie coming out in 2021 actually ended in 1969, let's talk about today's sponsor, Skillshare. 
Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of classes in all manner of subjects, available to anyone interested in expanding their knowledge and learning something new. If you're a filmmaker, or just looking into creating videos, check out Nikki Stevens' class, Creative Video Storytelling and Editing, Making the Most of Stock Footage. Nikki is a graphic designer and video editor, who walks through not only the nuts and bolts of acquiring stock footage, but also the artistry of using stock footage well. With detailed instruction, insight, and a short assignment, Nikki can teach you how to make stock footage look like more than just stock footage, whether for filmmaking or marketing needs. Skillshare is also ad-free, and the first 1,000 people who click the link in the description will get a free one-month trial of Skillshare's premium membership. Whether you're a pro looking to sharpen your skills or a novice striking up a new hobby, Skillshare has got you covered. From its very beginning, On Her Majesty's Secret Service positions itself as a culmination of 60s Bond, the prerequisite title sequence awash with images from the earlier films. A bit later, James empties his desk at MI6, reminiscing over props from his old adventures, each new object accompanied by notes from the appropriate Bond film. The main purpose of these callbacks was likely to reaffirm continuity, that Lazenby's Bond was indeed the same character audiences had followed since Dr. No. This was hardly the first Bond movie to reference prior films, but in invoking the very specific iconography and music of the past, Majesty stirs a potent nostalgia. The viewer is made to reflect on the history of James Bond in the context of a movie defined by moving on. Even more than British pride, the loss of time is the dominant theme of the opening titles. Silhouettes of martinis double as hourglasses pouring away, while Bond hangs precariously on the arms of a clock as his time runs out. Even Bond's reminiscence is during a scene where he intends to resign from MI6. More than just recognition of the familiar, these callbacks stew in finality, that this is indeed the end of James Bond. And I believe this true of both Bond as a character, and as a leader of action-adventure filmmaking. Regarding the latter, it's important to remember just how massive and influential James Bond was in the 1960s. Action movies like this largely didn't exist before 007. The closest version would have been Alfred Hitchcock thrillers like The 39 Steps, and especially North by Northwest, but while there is a lot of hitch in 60s Bond, there's also major differences. James Bond was not a wrong man dropped into a chaotic situation, but a super spy who sought out the danger in the first place. Enhancing the fantasy were ever more diabolical villains and their insidious schemes, along with action scenes which mixed comic book thrills with a palpable sense of violence. The influence of the style and action was inescapable. This is most apparent in the volume of spy ripoff films released through the mid to late 1960s. But it can also be seen in both the stylish title sequences and superpowered hero of Sergio Leone's Dollars trilogy and the subsequent genre of spaghetti westerns. Or in a movie like The Dirty Dozen, which mixed a traditional World War II men-on-a-mission formula with the hardened edge and casual attitude towards violence exhibited by James Bond. This was the legacy Peter Hunt inherited with On Her Majesty's Secret Service. And to look at the film's action scenes is to see how Hunt built off his predecessors. Particularly influential was Terence Young, the first Bond director who Hunt worked under as an editor, and the traces are readily apparent. Like Young, Hunt presents Bond with a similar mix of worldly sophistication and brutish strength, while his action scenes emphasize very tactile threats, rather than the sci-fi silliness Goldfinger and You Only Live Twice leaned into. But while the core principles may be in line with Young's vision, Hunt's style is markedly different. As an editor on the previous films, Hunt famously used disjunctive editing techniques, like jump cuts, to give action scenes an extra punch. It's a technique that still jars modern viewers, one cranked to 11 with On Her Majesty's Secret Service. Jump cuts are given further weight through crushing sound effects, 
It's so loud they seem to be just as much an attack on the audience. And as a director, Hunt also uses the camera to similar disjunctive ends, most notably the frequent snap zooms which greatly enhance physical sensation. A multi-camera setup also allows Hunt to maximize coverage, making for fight scenes with complete clarity, while the rapid cutting between angles aids the kinetic flow of battle. The result are fights which move with relentless speed, but never lose their coherency. We always feel oriented within the space. One of the best examples of this is the opening scene on the beach, where tight framing of the fight is cut with quick but crucial close-ups of Tracy and key Einlein matches, planting the seeds of her escape while keeping the energy with the bare knuckle punch out. The clarity and the emphasis on physical threats echo Terence Young, but the sheer speed and dynamism of the action are from iterations brought by Peter Hunt. And for as much as Hunt emphasizes a very visceral sense of physicality and violence throughout, he does not abandon Guy Hamilton or Lewis Gilbert's sense of spectacle. Despite walking back on the gadgets and the grandness of hollowed out volcanoes, On Her Majesty's Secret Service still manages to up the spectacle of a 007 adventure. The key is in the scope of the action and the daring of the stunts. Bond's ski-bound escape from Blofeld's mountaintop is a prime example, a balletic display of athleticism with incredible on-location cinematography on Piz Gloria. Bond action had been shot on real locations before, but the verticality of Bond's mountain descent, achieved through the use of handheld close-ups, make for a whole new excitement, as if the audience is whirling down the mountain too. And amidst the stunt work and machine gun fire, Hunt still finds tension in these simple complications, most notably when Bond has to continue the chase on one ski. It's a perfect mix of Bond's maximalist spectacle and a very tangible sense of tension. This also applies to the climactic siege on Blofeld's base. The large-scale assault had been a series staple since Goldfinger, and not only does Majesty up the bombast, with multiple helicopters filmed yet again atop his Gloria, but the scene is also cross-cut with a much more dire life-or-death struggle between Tracy and a heavy. The scene even culminates in paying off a key detail in the setting which had been established earlier. <laughs> To my eyes, this is the best action in all of James Bond. The film's third act, with its near endless marathon of blistering set pieces, wherein even dialogue scenes are haunted by the specter of danger, amount to the most breathless and invigorating minutes the series has ever seen. In both its evolution of Bondian action and the sheer excitement its set pieces generate, On Her Majesty's Secret Service, represented the peak of 007 as an action franchise. Even in a year where Sergio Leone was pushing his operatic style of western action to unfathomable extremes, or when Sam Peckinpah's use of slow motion created a new type of balletic destruction in action filmmaking, On Her Majesty's Secret Service still stood as a leader in the genre creating set pieces which were peerless and exhilarating. It is a peak the series would never fully reach again, but we'll put a pin in that for now, as amidst the bombast and thrills are also tweaks to the usual formula, which subtly, yet substantially, alter the character of James Bond. The climactic battle, for example, does not see Bond backed by any government or military organization, but the Italian Mafia working against the expressed orders of MI6. Indeed, unlike occasionally terse but ultimately friendly relationship between Bond and his superiors in previous films, Majesty sees a great deal more tension. Ironically, the Bond film most awash in images of English patriotism is also the first to question how just Her Majesty's Secret Service really is. But of course, the most substantial iteration on the formula is the inclusion of Tracy. Perhaps the defining feature of Honor Majesty's Secret Service, 
arguably more than the pulse-pounding action, or John Barry's phenomenal score, or even that it was Lazenby's sole outing in the tux, is that this is the movie where 007 got married. Really though, that's a reductive description. Tracy had changed James long before wedding bells were rung. The very casting of Diana Rigg, an accomplished actor with extensive experience on stage and screen, is immediately significant. Prior Bond girls were cast almost exclusively for their beauty and sex appeal, the actors often being models with little to no acting experience and whose thick non-English accents were often dubbed anyways. I don't want to overemphasize this point, as I do feel the early Bond girls are sometimes unfairly dismissed when the characters are often more interesting than appearances may suggest. All the same though, it's clear where the filmmakers' priorities lay. Tracy, however, is a much more fully formed character, with complex backstory, motivations, and a complete character arc. She also takes a far more active role within the narrative, saving Bond's life multiple times and fighting back against the villains. As if to underlie this point, the camera doesn't fetishize Tracy's body the way Bond girls of the past had been. To be sure, Diana Rigg is stunningly beautiful, and the film doesn't avoid sexualization entirely, but there is far less emphasis on merely ogling her body. Even in the opening, which is openly voyeuristic and does frame Tracy primarily as someone to be gazed upon by Bond and the audience, the tone is less explicitly sexual. The dark lighting and long flowing gown feel much more like doomed romance than any sexual gratification. Riggs' strengths as an actor also come through, with Tracy able to cut through other characters as if they were nothing. Please, please, Teresa. There's only a possibility. Nothing definite. Tell him, Papa, or you'll never see me again. Even that Shakespeare background comes in handy when Tracy recites the prose of playwright James Elroy Flecker. For thee the ships are drawn down to the waves. For thee the markets throng with myriad slaves. For thee, the hammer or the anvil rings. For thee? Indeed, Majesty completely flips the typical makeup of the actors. This time, the Bond girl is the seasoned thespian, while James is the model without acting experience. Hell, at one point, Lazenby's even dubbed in the movie. Myself. Tactfully adjusted to favor me. This subversion also plays into one of the key tropes of the Bond movies what authors Tony Bennett and Janet Willicott call ideological repositioning. I suspect some Bond fans' ears perked up at the implication that Diana Rigg was the first accomplished actor to be cast as a Bond girl, given before Rigg, fellow Avengers star Honor Blackman was cast as Pussy Galore in 1964's Goldfinger. And while a memorable character with a distinct personality, any strength or agency is largely snuffed out when Bond forces himself on her in order to thwart Goldfinger's scheme. This trope of repositioning is seen throughout the series, where Bond's sheer sexual magnetism is enough to convert women from evil to good. No more games. Dr. Evil sent me here to kill you, but, but I find you so sexy and... It's a trope Majesty essentially references through dialogue, with Draco's belief that all Tracy needs to put her life in order is a firm masculine presence. She needs a psychiatrist, not me. What she needs is a man to dominate her. Seems like textbook stuff for this series, but the movie proves both Draco and James wrong. Tracy doesn't need a man to dominate her, and she doesn't need a psychiatrist either. All she needed was someone to treat her with empathy and kindness. I find it very telling that initial scenes between James and Tracy are colored with the same brutish misogyny that underlined prior romances in the series. There's this implication that, at any moment, Bond will take Tracy in his arms and make passionate love to her, but he keeps stepping away. Instead, Tracy takes charge, but the act is purely transactional, as if in response to the way women in Bond movies have been used then discarded. It's totally empty with Hunt's camera denying viewers the prurient pleasures of on-screen sexuality. The romance doesn't really begin in earnest until outside the track, not with sex or even a kiss, 
but a gentle hug. I don't mean to pretend this relationship brazenly feminist, because it certainly isn't, but the film does deliberately evoke the more virulently misogynistic side of the series, only to then emphasize a kinder and more empathetic romance. The result is a much more sensitive and vulnerable bond, a characterization well suited to Lazenby's boyish looks. That vulnerability extends throughout On Her Majesty's Secret Service. One of my favorite scenes in the film is after the ski chase, as Bond desperately tries to lose Blofeld's men in a massive crowd. The film cuts between a frantic Bond and his many pursuers, as the crowd becomes more and more overwhelming, the increasing speed of the cuts amplifying the anxiety. And amidst this chaos, Bond slowly slumps over in exhaustion, completely out of ideas. It is in this moment that Tracy returns to the picture after a long absence, her presence bringing with it an indescribable warmth. Rescuing Bond is really just an extension of how important Tracy is to James. As 007 historian James Chapman notes, Bond doesn't reposition Tracy, she repositions him. Through their romance, James comes to question his allegiance to MI6 ultimately leaving Spycraft to marry the woman he loves, and start a new life. It is here where the changes to Bond's character become more than tweaks, but true growth. The film's ending plays as a variation on the series' formula. Every Bond film prior had ended with James in seclusion making out with his leading lady, and the reassurance that his adventures would continue. Majesty also sees Bond alone with his lover, but the tone is more romantic, the atmosphere all the more final. This is an ending for the character, until it gets ripped away. Blowfell. To quote film critic Molly Haskell, James and Tracy's love is killed by the very conventions it had defied. For how indeed could Bond go back to philandering and espionage when he was a married man? Tracy had to die, and her death is absolutely crushing. Not through overwrought melodrama, but the sheer simplicity of the scene. After two hours of escapist action, suddenly the consequences of violence come crashing down. And it feels cruel. There's no goodbye or closure. Tracy's death is not part of some character arc for the film's hero. She's just gone. James is left shattered and in denial, while the film quietly reflects on her loss. And it's at that moment that the series fractures. Just as Bond could not return to his old ways as a loving husband, how too could the films return to breezy adventure and entertainment after inflicting such a wound? As the credits begin, the iconic James Bond theme comes roaring on the soundtrack, as if to reassure audiences that all was well. James Bond will return in Diamonds Are Forever, after all. But the efforts feel hollow and wrong, like the universe is trying to revert to the way things were before Tracy, trying to pretend everything's okay. Diamonds Are Forever proceeds as if On Her Majesty's Secret Service never happened. Connery is back, no reference is made to Tracy, or that Bond had left MI6. The film does open with Bond hunting Blofeld, which might imply a continuation of Majesty's story, but nothing about the light-hearted tone or excited buildup of Connery's return suggests James is grieving or in any way changed. It's alright. It's quite alright, really. She's having a rest. Welcome to hell, Blofeld. This feels less like a sequel to Majesty than it does to You Only Live Twice, which also ended with Blofeld escaping from Bond's clutches. The opening shot of Diamonds even references You Only Live Twice's Japanese setting. More than just erasing the diegetic events of the last movie, though, Diamonds Are Forever is also, more broadly, the complete antithesis of On Her Majesty's Secret Service. Where Hunt's film was a sincere adventure with a serious love interest 
and ambitions to grow both the character and the visual poetry of the series, Diamonds Are Forever is a comical send-up. Connery's performance is defined by a sarcastic unattachment. The action plays as a series of gags, and any romance is completely surface. Clearly, the goal was to return to the same mix of escapist action and light comedy that had made Goldfinger such a phenomenon, the producers even bringing back Guy Hamilton to direct. But sometimes, you really can't go home. For all its efforts, Diamonds can't recapture the old magic. Connery comes off less as a sexy hero and more a lecherous bully while the movie's drab and ugly cinematography lacks any romance or intrigue. And to return to the action filmmaking peak 007 had hit with On Her Majesty's Secret Service, the series plateaued with Diamonds Are Forever. <laughs> Apart from a claustrophobic fight scene in an elevator, the action in Diamonds is inert and lifeless, clumsy in its staging and shot selection with minimal excitement. The most telling scene in this regard has to be the car chase on the Vegas Strip. There are a handful of thrilling shots which stress the speed and ferocity of the vehicles, but the bulk of the chase is rather slow and plodding, the smashing of cop cars a poor distraction from the mundane scene construction. Particularly notable is this final bit, where Bond enters an alley leaning on the right side of his car, only to emerge from the other end leaning on the left side. This rather blatant continuity error is addressed by a yet more baffling insert of the car rolling over inside the alley. I suspect the fix might have been an attempt at some winking humor, but it mostly stresses how fake the action is, and serves as a poor finale to the scene. The chase on the whole is not entirely lacking in merit, but it is weak, especially when compared to the awesome reality of chases in films like Vanishing Point, Duel, and especially The French Connection, all released that same year. In the two years since Majesty, Bond had been thoroughly lapped by his peers. Indeed, the 1970s brought a new breed of action hero, tough as nails men who enforced a rigid and brutal sense of law and order. As Connery finally left for good and Roger Moore jumped on board for 1973's Live and Let Die, the series would struggle to keep up with hardened and more modern heroes who had left Bond behind. No longer the trendsetter, the series would also begin to emulate the style of other action movies, cribbing black exploitation in Live and Let Die and kung fu movies for The Man with the Golden Gun. James Chapman notes the significance of Live and Let Die's third act, where Bond abandons his Walter PPK for a 357 Magnum the gun made famous by Clint Eastwood in Dirty Harry. Quoting Chapman, The fact that Bond on one occasion adopted the weapon associated with another screen hero was indicative of how the Bond series had been overtaken by other trends in popular cinema. And to some extent, 007 has never escaped those trends. The series has certainly seen major triumphs throughout the decades since, but it's never fully reclaimed its throne as the gold standard in action filmmaking. The Spy Who Loved Me was a huge artistic and commercial comeback for James Bond that was also roundly bested by the gargantuan success of Star Wars, thus the inclusions of space lasers and shuttlecraft in Moonraker. The sheer volume of set pieces in Raiders of the Lost Ark meant Octopussy had to up the quantity of action scenes. The influence of movies like Lethal Weapon gave us, in License to Kill, James Bond as renegade cop who doesn't play by the rules, going after not a globe-conquering tyrant, but a vicious drug dealer. Even when Pierce Brosnan and Martin Campbell revived the series with aplomb in Goldeneye, the film was overtaken to the tune of 100 million by a newer, sexier spy series just a year later. Subsequent Bonds had to be more modern, more hip, with an ever-increasing emphasis on technology in front of and behind the camera. Even the Daniel Craig era, which has largely been lauded with praise and awards, is rather transparently riffing on the influence of Jason Bourne and Christopher Nolan's Batman movies. 
Throughout these iterations, the popularity of the character has ebbed and flowed, occasionally waning, but never for too long. I'm not trying to imply the franchise's success ended with the 1960s, merely its time at the forefront of action cinema. For even in his greatest artistic and commercial triumph since Majesty, James Bond has been a follower. And over the course of this history, on Her Majesty's Secret Service's status has steadily risen. The producers were quick to wash their hands of the film in the early 70s. May I remind you, 007, that Blofeld's dead. Finished. As the series made a decisive shift away from Hunt's vision, and Majesty drifted to the background. Why would the producers want to promote the film, given it not a big success and Lazenby a one-and-done Bond? But slowly, the legacy of the film would begin to bleed back into the series. Many lady friends, but married only once. Wife killed All right, you've made your point. You're sensitive, Mr. Bond. About certain things, yes. Did I see something wrong? He was married once, but it was a long time ago. Try as they might, there really was no escaping Tracy and what she meant to James. Even if 007 had reverted back to a devil may care super spy, a hint of tragic loss lingered on. Even beyond direct references, I don't think it coincidence many of the best and most successful Bond movies since 1969 take clear influence from On Her Majesty's Secret Service. The Spy Who Loved Me's success was rooted largely in a return to maximalist spectacle and death-defying stunt work, along with a leading lady capable of matching Bond. Martin Campbell's emphasis on more hard-hitting personal stories that made both Goldeneye and Casino Royale such strong reintroductions is also in line with Majesty, with the latter even giving Bond a similar devastating loss in the death of Vesper. John Glenn, the director who carried the series throughout the 1980s, was first apprenticed up by Peter Hunt as the editor and second unit director of On Her Majesty's Secret Service. When it came time to direct his own Bond picture, it's clear what he used as a model, for your eyes only rich in practical stunt work, tangible threats, and a more human emotional connection. Oh, and uh, lots of winter sports. What makes each and every one of these movies top tier Bond comes down to finally catching up with On Her Majesty's Secret Service. The once perceived failure had slowly transformed into the pinnacle of who James Bond is and what the movies could be. Praised not just by fans, but also by filmmakers like Steven Soderbergh and Christopher Nolan, the latter of which borrowed extensively from Majesty's Snowbound Battle for the third act of Inception. On Her Majesty's Secret Service is an embodiment of the spectacle and daring which had made 007 the peak cinematic hero of the 1960s, Hunt building on the series' foundations while simultaneously experimenting with the character and aesthetics of Bond. For all the good, and even great Bond movies since then, the series has never been as bold or adventurous. And to be clear, that's okay. Much as I've been very critical of the James Bond movies made in Majesty's Wake, those films still mean a lot to me, and I wouldn't trade them for the world. The best of which are very entertaining pieces of escapist filmmaking, and even the weakest entries prove interesting. Much as I lament the days when 007 led the charge in action movies, I also find it rewarding to see how the series adapted to the trends of the day. I think it's pretty neat that one series chronicles the evolution of Western action-adventure movies across the last 60 years. To return to Majesty is to see the final glimpse of James Bond at his glorious best. The series and character may endure, but On Her Majesty's Secret Service was the end of an era. And wow. <laughs> What a way to go. James, 